two, check two, check two. Hey everybody, how's it going? Bring this down. Two, check two, check two. There we go. How's everyone doing? All right, let me crank your mic and let me turn off the audio. All right, there we go. That was a nice non-fade out. <laughs> hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to Crosstalk Solutions. This is a live stream. This is what we're calling our Castaways live stream, where we're going to be talking about a really cool project that uh, Brandon did uh, about uh, six months ago or so. Um, yeah, it was uh, October, November. Uh, yeah. When I was out there. Um, let me make sure that everyone is on. This, by the way, is Brandon Yarbrough. Uh, you guys have seen him on the channel before. He is our wireless ISP expert. Let me go ahead and silence my phone or else we're going to be getting calls off the hook here. Uh, and of course, as always, guys, if um, if there's any problems with the audio or anything that you can't hear, anything like that, let me know in the chat. And uh, yes, there we go. All right. Good morning from Puerto Penasco, Mexico. You know where Puerto Penasco is? Uh, my audio is really low. Can you, is it any better now? Yeah, let's see. We can maybe fix Brandon's audio. Uh, I can crank him a little bit. Go ahead and say test, test, check, check test, something. Test, test, check, one, two, hello. Yeah, you are a little low. Maybe just bring this mic closer. Okay, how about, how's that? That's probably better. Okay. Okay. Good morning, David Stevenson. Brandon's audio very low. It seems like wrong mic in use. It's definitely not the wrong mic in use. We should, uh, we'll just get him up on the mic. It should be all good. I can also crank it. Uh, it also takes about 10 seconds for any changes to uh, be picked up, so. Okay. New England, hello. All the way from New England. <laughs> Tampa. I, might, I bet it's hot and muggy in Tampa today. <laughs> Sounds a bit better at last check. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. All right. Well, hello to everyone. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, again, we're going to be talking about wireless ISP stuff because we have our wireless ISP expert in-house. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've ever had anyone uh, in my office. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, live from the office. All right, let's go ahead and switch uh, to our other view. I want to double check that that is working. Control Shift 3. There we go. Okay, so now we should be able to see the chat. You guys can also see our uh, live subscriber count. I was hoping that we were gonna maybe get close to 75,000. Oh, really? Streak wave. Streak wave's calling me. All right, now I'm putting it on Do Not Disturb. Uh, I was hoping that we were gonna get uh, 75,000 subscribers for this live stream. As you guys can see, we're really, really close. Uh, you know what the funny thing is, is anytime I put up my live subscriber count, um, people start unsubscribing oh, just to mess with me. <laughs> hey guys, don't do that while we're on the video. <laughs> so that's fine. But uh, very, very close to 75,000 subscribers. And of course, uh, thank you guys for helping make that happen. We really appreciate uh, each and every one of you. There we go. Look, someone unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, okay, so... Uh, we're going to get started. Basically, we had a, uh, I, I did a little promo for Castaways, our Castaways promo. And um, essentially, what happened is we got contacted, oh, last, probably last July or August. And uh, someone had seen the producers of this show. Uh, he's also the producer that did the show alone, if you guys are familiar with that show, another show that I actually like a lot. I like watching these kind of survival shows. Um, but he had actually seen me, uh, strapping, you know, access points to the trees out in the backyard and that led him to contact us and, uh, and start talking about this big project that he had going on. So they were producing a new show. We didn't have any idea what the show was at the time. We just knew that it was kind of like a survivor-esque type, uh, you know, reality show and that it was going to be on a very, very remote island on the other side of the world where they didn't have any internet or any power but they needed to set up a mesh wireless network that covered, I think it was about seven miles of coastline? Correct, it was seven miles of coastline and the network itself was not for internet distribution but all internal LAN traffic um, to do mostly security and communications for the staff monitoring the contestants. Yeah, so 
the monitoring of the contestants was apparently, look, more people are unsubscribing. The monitoring of the contestants was um, something that they basically just wanted to, you know, it saved them a lot of money to have this mesh network with cameras and stuff like that, as opposed to, um, you know, having people staffed to basically keep an eye on the contestants at all time or something like that, if I remember Correct. correctly. Um, let me pop this back to our full screen view so people aren't unsubscribing. Uh, and so if you guys remember when I was doing my solar Wi-Fi testing last year, that was sort of in conjunction with this project. Brandon was doing his own testing out where he lives, and uh, I was doing some testing out here, just trying to see how long we could kept, keep access points online and stuff like that so that we could come up with a good solid solution for this project. Um, and then, of course, the project ended up proceeding going forward, and it was last October? Yeah, it was the latter part of October into early November that I went out there. Yeah. Um, and so, tell us about the trip. I mean, I know it was a hell of a hell of a feat actually getting out there. Yeah, it was almost a 40, hour, 40 hours worth of plane rides and layovers to get out there. Um, but it was well worth it, and I'd, I'd go back in a heartbeat. So, how many plane rides and how many boat rides? Just one boat ride. <laughs> um, I believe it was five air, different airplane transfers and layovers. Wow. Uh, the longest of which was, uh, was in Jakarta. Um, yeah, you were in Jakarta for like almost a full day, right? Yeah, almost a full day. Yeah. And then, and then just a brief layover in, in Japan. But all the others were relatively quick. So most of the time was spent on a plane um, in, in the steerage class. But that's... Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, the volume's low. I think you're also not talking very loud, Brandon. So okay. So, right up on that mic. All right, guys. I'll talk I'm louder. i a little bit. Uh, that's all right. Don't worry about that. I got stuff falling apart on the side of the office here. Um, yeah. So then uh, got to Jakarta. And wasn't there a thing also where you had to have an escort that, like, helped sort of grease palms and get you through the rest of the way of the trip or something like that? No, no, no. That, that they, they had someone pick me up from the airport to make sure once I actually landed at our, at our final destination, destination, they picked us up and they had their own uh, transportation people so we weren't trying to take taxis and figure out the local, uh, the local tax, taxi people to tell them where to go and end up places we weren't there. They had their own transportation, so everything was very safe and and didn't have any problems. Right, right. And then you finally got out there. Now, now talk, talk about the actual um, deployment a little bit. Like, kind of how was it structured? What did we kind of, what did we kind of end up coming up with for the final design? So initially it was, we want you to put a network seven miles across coastline and there's a beach where all of the access points will be and you'll be, we'll be putting, you know, the solar panels on uh, basically some sort of stand out on the beach so that they would get plenty of sun. And they would they told me that we would have, you know, 12 hours of sunlight, no problem. And so I designed the solar system around getting a minimum of 12 hours of sunlight of 100% of sun per day. And I did that based off my testing at my home in, in, in New Mexico. And I had at least 12 hours of sun in my in my home and I was able to run the the, the devices 24 7 non-stop no problem um, by the time I got out there it was a completely different story they had access points and everything in trees with some foliage covering them we'll go through some some pictures here shortly and we'll show you guys exactly the the, the actual photos that we took while we were on site uh, but most of it was in trees, and we were trying to figure out other ways of getting more sunlight. When I got out there, they had most of everything pre-installed so that all I had to do was fine-tune it and program it to make sure it was working. Um, and the, the staff and the hands that they had were, were absolutely fantastic. Uh, didn't have to do too much of the actual labor myself uh, based on the rules and regulations of the local uh, country there. We weren't, pro provide, we weren't allowed to do the actual labor we were only allowed to provide technical advice. So. Now, um, all ubiquity. It was a 100% ubiquity network with some power injectors that were, uh, we ended up using a, a boost transformer injector from Ty Tycoon, I believe. Tycon, I think Tycon, yeah. yeah. Um, that boosted 12 volts to 24 volts 
for the PoE injector in order to provide enough power on all of the ubiquity mesh radios. Um, those mesh radios wouldn't work on a standard 12 volt like the AeroS stuff will actually work in a variety of voltages from 12 to 28 volts, I believe, is, yeah. the, is the range that those will operate. The mesh needed the 24 solid, so we had to use the special PoE injectors to make it work. But it, it did work, and that was the great thing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I muted my mic, and then I think what we'll do is we'll just use yours. Okay. Uh, we'll just put it in the center here, and then um, we'll both just have to kind of speak up a little bit. No problem. Um, okay, so... Um, Let's do it. Let's go through some of the pictures. I think that'll be fun. Let me bring these up in my other monitor here. Give me one second here, guys. Bear with us. We are professionals, but not that professional. All right. So, yeah, here we go. And well, I, these are in no particular order, by the way. Uh, so we'll just go through them and talk about them as we hit them. Uh, let's see. OBS, Control Shift. Three, there we go. Hey, so this is <laughs> this is what the coastline looked like, and this is what Brandon was dealing with as far as like where to put. Okay, I mean, if you guys are imagining, like, hey, you need to get a solar panel and a wireless antenna on this cliff. Like, wh like, where do you put it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's pretty amazing that that was the terrain that he walked into. I, you were probably expecting a lot of like crystal, like white sand beaches. And... Yeah, when when <laughs> it was when it was brought to my, you know, hey, we want you to put it on coastline. I was expecting, you know, a nice long, easy entrance, white sand beach with you know, jungle beyond that. They didn't tell me it would be a hundred feet of razor sharp rocks and <laughs> mangroves growing out of it. Right. So let's go through here. Let's see. Here's some more of the coastline. So there were some beaches. You yeah. can see it was like, you know, a little bit. But also keep in mind that they're filming. So not only did they, you know, they, they, they had to kind of hide the access points in the solar panels as well on top of everything else. So uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Here's some of the guys, the locals that are actually building. This is actually the pontoon. So you guys had pontoons in the water off the coastline with a basically a backhaul antenna picking up a signal from the land and then you had that pumping out to an omnidirectional antenna on the pontoon that would then transmit to the coastline. So it started off as a directional antenna on this pontoon and we triangulated three anchors off of it in order to prevent it from turning but the the tides were so the, the tide was just such a big swing in 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 tidal movement that even with three anchors, we couldn't keep it steady, so we ended up having to change that to to an omni, um, and we we ended up putting two different omnis in different frequencies on that uh, on the raft, in order to keep a reliable signal um, to be able to relay around a large point in this island. Was there just one raft? Just one raft, um, and then we had two vessels that were kind of the home for the the film crew and the producers. The, and, and everyone who's working the show. Yeah. Uh, by the way, guys, if you do have any questions uh, for Brandon or myself, it doesn't even have to be about this uh, Castaways thing, um, make sure you put those in the uh, chat, and then we will try to get those answered. Of course, as always, Super Chats are also enabled. If you guys have a question that's just burning a hole in your pocket and you want to get that answered for sure, uh, shoot us a Super Chat. Any Super Chat questions that come through, we will answer to the best of our ability. And hello, Mark from Ireland. Mark Hanley. That's a very Irish name. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving on with our slideshow here. So these are some more photos. In addition to the radios that we had placed on uh, on the raft, they also had some repeaters for their two-way radios uh, on the raft. And, and that is like barely a raft. It was barely a raft. <laughs> that um, is about... So we had a, a generator... I think we ended up with three or four solar panels on there and a, a large bank of batteries as well. And the batteries are in this box right here. Yeah, the I batteries assume. are all inside the the, the watertight boxes. And yeah. We sealed them all. And that large coil is some Heliax wire or coaxial cable going to the antennas for the two-way repeaters. Why do they have so much coiled cable? They I couldn't tell you. They just ordered... Uh, I think they assumed that the repeaters were originally going to be up in a on a hill somewhere mm. so they were going to leave the the generator and the the repeater system 
down on the beach and then just run the antenna up to where it had to be, but they decided on this instead. Right. And very resourceful people out there. So here's a look at, it's a little tough to see, but here is a look at, <laughs> here is a look at one of the things that they came up with. And we got a super chat from Jay. Brandon, I hear what you're saying, but you have no tan. Were you really there? <laughs> yes, yes, I was really there. Um, actually lived in Mexico for five years prior to coming back to the States. And it takes a lot of sunscreen to maintain this level of pastiness. <laughs> no doubt. Um, okay, so... Uh, so yeah, so here is one of the the sort of rigs that they came up with. Uh, you can see that it's just a bunch of bamboo that's sort of staked and tied together coming off the edge of this rock here. And these are, by the way, like razor sharp uh, uh, sort of coral type rocks. Uh, and then what you can see here is they stretch it out over the water. Is this bag the like a battery or what is this? No, that bag is just there because we had low, we had skiffs that were zipping around the area. We just didn't want anybody to hit it on accident. Yeah. So it was just kind of a, a, a flag to identify it that it was there so you don't get hit. Uh, and then right here you can see a nano station. So the nano station pointed back towards the vessels um, and then it was just bridged up to the Omni and we had several. Uh, other nano stations connecting to that specific omni in order to to get its link into it but the the nano station down below pointed directly to the vessel which also had an omni on it uh, we used primarily five gigahertz non-ac equipment just standard five gigahertz equipment for the entire network uh, to, to make this happen and the mesh access points so the rocket m5 correct that's and then a, this is a one of the small mesh ap's right here correct so that's the mesh ap in order to this? There we go. You guys get a better look at that. So we had backhaul nano station, rocket M5 with an Omni, and then the mesh uh, APs. Yep. And they're painted too. We got some close-ups of the mesh APs painted. I get that question on a regular basis. Uh, can you paint the access points? Can you paint the ubiquity equipment? And the answer is yes, you can, as long as you're not using any sort of lead or metal-based paint. And you'll probably want to make sure that it works before you do that paint job. Uh, they will not RMA your antennas once you paint them. Uh, <laughs> no Andrew doubt. asks where I was staying while I was there. I was actually staying on one of the vessels. I will send, show you guys a picture of one of the vessels that were out there shortly. Uh, let's see. Someone else asked, uh, Algo do asks, how do you get internet there? Algo, we were all on satellite internet uh, on the vessel, but there was no internet throughout the, the network I built. It was all local connection only. Yeah, just just a LAN. So this was just for their communications equipment and some cameras. John, um, absolutely. There was very little 2.4 gigahertz interference. However, because I was needing so many different links, a simple 2.4 gigahertz network wasn't going to be feasible because there's not enough channels within that spectrum. Makes sense. <clears throat> Is there other spectrums that you would have maybe considered other than the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz um 365 would have been great because it would have given me a little bit more penetration um even 900 megahertz would have been great to go through some of the trees but the the cost point is much higher on those equipment right um so we just opted to go with the with the 5 gigahertz because there's plenty of spectrum in the 5 gigahertz range sure and and that's what worked with uh notice here also so yeah, so that's the there's solar the panel. Solar, and here's the battery box right here. So that's when I first got there where they had everything staged. Um, when I got there, obviously I noticed that the solar panels were covered by most of the foliage and they weren't getting a true 12 hours and we were having a lot of outages. So the way around that was to move the solar panels down away from the foliage and we actually added additional access points, uh, sorry, additional solar panels to the, the key relay, relay points. And in some locations, we ended up just having to change out batteries every couple of days because they weren't getting enough charge. So we were charging the batteries on the on the big boat with the, the generators and then bringing them back out and swapping them out so that they would reconnect. Yeah. God, that's crazy. All right, let's keep going here. What else we have? So here's another look. There's one of the vessels that, you, that they were staying on. A really nice sort of yacht-type boats, yeah? Yeah, so they were both very large boats. Um, the camera crew was staying on, on the larger, uh, 
larger boat and I was on the older boat, but the, the, the staff and the crew on the, on the vessels that were hosting us were top notch. Food was fantastic. The, the, the amenities were far beyond what I was expecting when I, when I agreed to go out there. I was expecting to be staying in a tent somewhere. Yeah. So John Mack asks, what a bandwidth requirements did they need for the cameras? Um, the cameras were actually very minimal. Um, two to three megabytes per camera megabits uh mega megabits yeah uh just it was just for security functions uh at night and uh and they did some of it hopefully we will see get to see some of that footage i don't know what's going to happen the show actually starts going to is going to air this week i hope you guys all uh uh, are, are watching it i'm sure abc would greatly appreciate that yeah and for those who are just tuning in we're talking about the show castaways it's going to be on abc it premieres i believe the 7th yes yeah it premieres on the 7th so if you guys have abc uh check out that show and maybe you can try to spot some ubiquity mesh access points in the trees <laughs> behind the contestants uh did you, did you use any qos in the network no we didn't use any qos in the network it was uh it was an all unify network it was didn't even have dhcp everything uh was was running on static uh al goto asks what episode was it it was the entire season not just one episode <laughs> yeah so brandon and, and how long were you there how long did it I was, take you to set it up i was initially scheduled to be there for 10 days ended up staying for 12 because we couldn't quite get everything done in time but i was able to extend my stay a couple days and, and get it all working I ended up leaving the day that the shooting started, um, and, and I was able to teach the producer more or less how to make changes as he needed, and we had, had communications with them throughout the, the, the photo, uh, be out, throughout the shoot. And the shoot was what, like two, two three months? Uh, I can't even tell you, but I know that it was much longer than I would have wanted to be on an island. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Uh, all right, let's see what else we got here. Oh, there's a beautiful sunset. Uh, this was we're not really allowed to tell you guys where this was it's an island in the south pacific somewhere uh here's another look at another setup that they did so here we can see a nano station backhaul uh again none of this stand stuff was our work this was all the locals they came up with all this stuff and they just sort of lashed it all together like they just went in the jungle and pulled out yeah we just said hey i need a pole 12 feet tall and they said okay give us two minutes and they come back you know out of the jungle with this bamboo poles and lashed it all together that's crazy um, and it was it was convenient because we were using renewable resources that we didn't have to bring out you know masts and and then take them back yeah um, so having in addition it also helped camouflage it you didn't have a big metallic pole out there sure so here, this is a this is a look at a, just one of the side stations, I guess. So it was a backhaul radio, and then a mesh access point, and then two sets of mesh access points on either side of the sort of main one, right? Yeah, that's the way it was designed when I did it on the computer. Actual deployment, there was some variation of that. I think we ended up doing some of as much as four or five uh, mesh units between backhauls. Just oh, because, really? Yeah, just because we... we couldn't get a link between some of the others and just made it work it was wow uh, one of the things so um jay asked were you able to have some fun i did get to go diving twice while i was out there um thanks to the the, the great staff on the boats uh, they're all great dive instructors and 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 dive masters so they allowed me to go diving twice while i was out there wasn't there some sort of like super poisonous octopus in yeah there? so there's something called a blue ring octopus if you guys haven't heard of it go google it um it's a very small octopus that has a neurotoxin that can actually kill a human in five minutes <laughs> well that's fun um i didn't see one uh <laughs> we got to see a couple of uh of reef sharks and the coolest thing i saw was something called a carpet shark um and uh, lots of great fish out there uh, i got to see my first clownfish in in the wild oh that's cool so that was really cool so. Uh, this says, did you get speed test results? So Mark Hanley from Ireland writes, did you get speed test results on the WLAN when it got fully up and running? Interesting to see a location with little background interference. Unfortunately, I did not have the opportunity to run any sort of IP, IPERF testing. 
Um, we literally fired up the cameras, made sure everything was working at each of the locations and said, okay, let's just go with this because our time was so tight when I was out there. We just wanted to make it work. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is the zone prone to strong winds or storms? Yes. So there was monsoons. This was monsoon season. It did rain a little bit while I was there. Wow. Uh, oh, good question from uh, Fidges. Fidges? That must be a Norwegian name or some sort of... You see that one? Well, Wellman? Fidges? T-H-I-J-S. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Uh, how much spare equipment and alternatives slash backups did you bring, and how did you plan for that? You know, we didn't take much. I had four or five extra antennas that I had pre-programmed and sent them that they took out there. And we ended up having to um, acquire some equipment while we were out there. So we were able to make some phone calls and get some, some, some of these things locally. Luckily, Ubiquity is a worldwide company, and there was able, we were able to get some of the equipment that we needed uh, locally. Some of the things we were having problems getting through uh, immigration and customs and couldn't bring through. So we ended up having to purchase additional equipment while we were there. Um, the main thing was the solar controllers. They wouldn't let those through customs for some reason or another, so we had to acquire yeah. those locally. But we found them, we got it working, and it, it's been, it, was, it ran great. Uh, so uh, Edward, I'm uh, sorry, um, Sightcast Tech says, what was the cost of this job approximately? We're not going to really talk about the cost, um, but you guys can imagine that it was just over like 100 of the mesh access points plus a handful of, other antennas and access points, not to mention the travel to get out there. So you can imagine it's 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 in that ballpark if you can do some some quick math there. Uh, let's see what else we got for pictures here. Uh, so here's a ladder that these guys built, and they're putting something up here in the trees. It's hard to see what that is. Uh, I believe that was one of the mesh access points that he is putting up. Oh yeah, you yeah. See Look, the here, battery. You see the battery box here. Yeah. There's a battery box in the tree. And then I think this is another mesh access point right there. Which yeah. Five gigahertz through that dense of foliage. It was, this was, again, right when I got there, and we were moving this because of the foliage. Um, we ended up cutting, cutting some of the foliage around it and getting a better uh, direct sunlight for the solar panels in order to keep that battery charged. Where is the solar panel? I it's even just see. to the left of, the, of his arm in the bush. Right in here? No, it's down on the flat spot. Right oh, there. down in here yeah, somewhere. Yeah, in there. How funny. I mean, they they put all these solar panels in in shady areas. <laughs> so it didn't work out too well. They had to move a bunch of them. Uh, we were right on the equator, so there was quite a bit of sun, but it wasn't enough to keep the, the, the everything charged. Then they just took the ladder apart and used it for poles. Yeah, I mean, they built that ladder. They built a lot of this stuff. I think we have some more ladder pictures coming up later. Here's another... Nice thick amount of brush. You can see they've got a. Uh, they're putting in. Looks like a solar panel in this. I mean, this is a. Is this a mangrove? Yeah, it's some sort of mangroves that they they had out there. We literally pulled up into the mangroves, threw everything out. I mean, look, they're pulling the boat right into this thick <laughs> mess of trees here, and uh, it looks like there's the battery box right there. There's the solar panel, and then I'm sure the mesh AP was up here in the tree somewhere. Yeah. All right, let's go. Let's go next. So, okay, so here's a better look at the raft in action. So this is the one that they were building earlier. Uh, and what you can see here is the pontoon. It was anchored in three spots. Um, originally, you guys went with a directional antenna and ended up switching it to an Omni because it was so, just... So, yeah, you can see the directional antenna down lower right there at the, the apex. Yep, right there. And it's like a Nano M5? It was a Nano Station M5. The reason we went with that was so that we wouldn't have to use any switches, and we could use a single PoE injector to power both the rocket and the Nano Station because yep. you have a pass-through port on mm -hmm. that device. Sure. Um, so we were able to, to pass everything through on that and make it a little bit easier to, to, to operate and keep the cost down not having to have a switch equipment out there. Right. Uh, all right, so let's see what we got next here. Uh, just another look at one of the locations. I think this is that one that we showed earlier, uh, but there's the solar panel for it. It's not a great picture. Yeah, so this that was one of the, the main locations right before or it was, is, was the main link back to the boats. Um, this particular location was hidden from where the contestants were, were doing their deal, so they couldn't see the boats, but we wanted to be able to get the, the wireless around this this rocky area. 
um, and that's what they had come up with to make it happen. Another picture of the pontoon or the little raft they built. Here's a setup. Okay, so there's a painted nano station. Uh, they sort of camouflage that one a little bit. You can see the solar panel up top, just sitting out here on this tree, and then a battery box right there. Uh, a couple of solar connectors. Oh, and here's the mesh AP right there. So this was kind of a standard deployment? Yes. <laughs> well, that's where the standard ones with uh, the nano station backhauls were. Yeah. That's what they looked like. Um, and this is what they came up with to get it out of the trees was to use some, some driftwood essentially, or dead trees in order to get it out and into the sun. So that one stayed charged. No problem. Um, what kind and what wattage solar panels were you using? They were, I, were they the Renogy? I don't even remember. Um, I think they were 150 watt, uh, solar panels. And they were all 12, 12 volt. Uh, CJOS 100, did you set up UNMS for monitoring in case something went down? No, you have to. Uh, we did not use UNMS. We just used the unified controller. Yeesh. Yeah, there was no edge devices, right? Oh, I guess there was uh, There was like the nanostations and stuff. Those would connect to UNMS. Right, so we used air, but... con we used air control and, uh, and unify. Does the painting... The branches they're put on, and even the ocean itself, caused much interference. Or was foliage and weather the biggest issue? I would say foliage was the biggest issue. Weather really wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, for five gigahertz, you don't have rain fade, especially at the ranges. We were, the the distances we were traveling, rain fade wasn't going to be an issue anyway. Um, and how impressed were you with the local ingenuity of solving problems? I was extremely impressed. The 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 talent that we had there, the, the, the crews were just, yeah, I can make that happen. Give me five minutes. Um, no one ever said no to anything, which I'd almost rather someone told me that they, if you can't do some things, tell me no, don't say yes, and then not be able to do it. So that's kind of a philosophy I live by. So if you ask me for a project and I tell you no, it's because I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Hey Judd, I think those battery boxes. I don't think they're actually sealed. I think they're. I think they're vented, uh, but they are weather resistant, right? Right. It was just waterproof from the top. Yeah. Yeah. So rain coming straight down would not get in there, basically. And what did we use for a unified control? I don't remember. Was it? I, we didn't have a cloud key. Did we have a server? Or we put it on a no, laptop. No, there was a cloud key. Oh, there was a cloud key. Yep. So we used the cloud key for that one. That, in retrospect, that's probably wasn't the safest bet. Right, especially with all some of the, the latest issues we've been having. A local controller probably would have been a better deal. Yeah. So how well did Unified Controller work in such a large deployment and without any internet? Uh, it didn't have any major problems. We didn't have a, in, any internet, uh, any reliable internet. There was internet from time to time. We were able to plug it into uh, the satellite internet and get some updates. But I did primarily all of the updates were done before sending it out on site. So we weren't didn't need a ton of bandwidth to make the system work. Yeah, everything was built and pre-staged and configured in the states before it was, you know, put on a pallet and shipped out to, uh, you know, the middle of nowhere. Right. All right. Let's see what else we got here. So here's another look. There's a little pole here, a battery box on the branches, nano station, mesh, painted mesh antenna right there, and then solar panel up top. That's cool. I feel like I could do that in my backyard. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Uh, here's another look at a thick mangrove. You can see a solar panel right there. It looks like they chopped away some of the tree. Solar panel right there, and there's a mesh antenna sticking out right there. Let me zoom in on that. So there we go. Mesh antenna sticking out. Solar panel right there. And then the battery box is somewhere in there. <laughs> That's a tight one. How many of these were there? Like these types of... A hundred plus uh, uh, mesh locations. So e this would be one mesh location. And right. There were a hundred of these. Yes. And how many of them were like in thick mangroves like that? A third of them. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, most of them were, you know, end up getting moved. Like most of the work was pre-done before I arrived. Uh, when I got there, we just had to fight, go go to every location and, and plug in the batteries because they didn't want it to drain the batteries before I got there. 
went there, plugged everything in, started getting a, the network working and, and some other electronics works. But it was definitely a beautiful country. Oh, so here's the makeshift, la makeshift ladder going up to a cliffside location. Uh, looks like access point there. I'm not, or the uh, solar panel there. I'm not seeing the access point on this one. It might be up like off the top. Yeah, the I don't recall where it was on, on that location. Wow. Um, so Robert Kircher says, sorry if I'm late, but uh, how did the power consumption work out with the panels? Did you have any power outages? Uh, yes, Robert, we did, but only because we weren't getting the sun, uh, the direct, enough direct sunlight, not because the power solar panel was undersized. Um, originally, we were anticipating 12 hours of direct sunlight per day, um, and there was a lot of vegetation where they placed these antennas, so I was maybe only getting 20% of the power getting, you know, of the of the solar panel's total available power, I was maybe getting 20% of it, so yeah. that was the main problem. Uh, speaking of uh, solar, quick plug here, we do have Solar Powered Wi-Fi Part 3 uh, coming out on the YouTube channel in probably about a month. Uh, we've got everything prepared for it, and Brandon's going to help me work on some solar power stuff here while he's in my, in my town, and uh, we will get another solar-powered video where we are taking all the stuff that we've learned from this project, from our previous testing, and we're sort of incorporating it into what we hope will be sort of the ultimate solar-powered Wi-Fi setup. So look for that soon. John asks if you, Ubiquity did any sponsoring for this. No, it was all privately funded. All private, yeah. This was a production company that hired us to do the whole thing. Uh, Ubiquity... Uh, didn't have anything to do with it. And uh, he says, have you basically seen any of the pictures yet? they got to be impressed. We This is the first time that we're ever showing these pictures. So no, Ubiquity has not seen any of this stuff yet. But that's a good idea. I'll shoot it over to them. I'm sure they'd love to see it. Uh, here's another shot of that same setup. So ladder in the water and then just psh, climb up there and get it done. Uh John asked if there was any obvious issues that we could plan for. Um, I would have put bigger batteries out to, from the get-go so that it would have enough uh, additional power and larger solar panels is probably what I would have done. And we did 150-watt solar panels? Yeah, I believe that's And you still would have gone larger, huh? I probably would have put 250 watts or, or two 150 watts at each location to ensure that they were getting enough power. Wow. Um, and that's... One of the main problems with doing that, though, is now we have to hide those larger or additional solar panels. Yeah. Our major hurdle here was keeping things out of view of the cameras and the network operational. Right. I'm going to be like eagle eye in that show. I am, Because I want to watch and see if any uh, of these... I, these I, I bet you their <laughs> post-production was pretty good about it, though. So this is just a little bit of behind-the-scenes footage for y'all before the, the, the show starts. Yeah. All right, so let's see. Next. Hey, there's, there's, there's Brandon out there. So you guys who were wondering if he was for sure out there, there we go. <laughs> um, and like I said, when, when they first said, yeah, you're going to get 12, 12 hours of sunshine, well, the first three or four days that I was there, it was raining nonstop. <laughs> right. Wow. Live Discord during the show. Hey, I will, I will be on Discord if you guys want to talk during the show. We can definitely set something up. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'd do that. I don't know if... Uh, so I don't have cable. So I don't know if um, it's on Hulu or something or when it's actually going to be well, quote-unquote live. ABC is over the air. I do have OTA, but I don't know... I, it's just been so long since I've actually sat down to watch a show when it was actually on. Right? There's this thing called commercials. I, I don't want to <laughs> deal with those. <laughs> but we could try to pull that off. Maybe we could try to do a live Discord during the show. That might be fun. It's a good idea, Jay. Uh, Elgato, uh, that was just a GoPro Hero 5. So this here is the one of the boats. Yep. There's two boats that were similar to this. Uh, here's more guys building the rafts. Daniel Dill, $5 Super Chat. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Just appreciate your videos. And late to the stream, what show? So the show that we're talking about, for anyone who's late to the stream, is a show that's premiering on ABC on August 7th. This is a show called Castaways. It's a Survivor-esque type show, um, but it looks really interesting. I love those kinds of shows, man. I, I love Survivor-type shows, 
Uh, and I would love to be on one someday, but I just can never do it because I'm allergic to fish and I'm allergic to shellfish. So, yeah. Um, power hiding PLE cables probably would have been easier if we would have been going into the jungle more, but we would have had to be putting these things up hundred <clears throat> foot trees, hundred plus foot trees. And that just wasn't feasible. Um, so that that wasn't an option for us at this time yeah here's another location you can see a solar panel on the side of the cliff battery box way up there i don't see any antennas in this picture they're probably up higher probably they're up up in the trees up there yeah i mean most of the cables we were using were 20 to 30 foot um oh, you know what the white cable right there is where it's going Oh, okay, so here you can kind of see, it's very tough to see <clears throat> over the live stream, I'm sure, but there's a white cable that kind of goes down this way. Cable yeah. pulling drones, that, that'll be the day. <laughs> I don't even know if that would have worked so well out in this, in this environment, but maybe. It's uh, Handy, too Handy's asking if this is on Komodo Island. No, it's not, but we cannot tell you the name of the island. Yeah, we can't really, really, it's part we can't of our, really reveal the location. It's part of our NDA that we, we would not tell you the exact location. Here's uh, some solar panels that they spray painted to camouflage a little bit. You can see that. Actually, this the, that looks pretty good, honestly. Not terrible. All right, let's see what else we got here. So there's, so again, here's some of the painted. That see, that's not a great camouflage job. No, and they uh, didn't did, <laughs> didn't quite get that uh, that rocket closed. But there's no cable in there, so it was. Uh, they I think they took it apart to to do the spray paint job. Um, someone asked if what kind of batteries we were using. We were using sealed lead acid batteries. Mark says, how did you go about detecting rain fade and working out positioning through the vegetation? Spectrum analyzers or good old trial and error or both? Uh, trial and error. Um, using 5 gigahertz and at the ranges we were using, you know, four or 500 feet, rain fade's not an issue. Yeah. Um, UV rated cables. No, we didn't use UV rated cables. We weren't out there long enough to justify that additional expense. Yeah, keep in mind this was all temporary. Like this whole thing was set up and then removed in about a three month period or less. Um, what happens to the equipment after the show? They brought all of the equipment back to the United States and they will reuse it on the next next season if they have it. Cool. I hope we get to go out and set that up again. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, all right, so here's some more nanostations. These are two nanostation M5s, again, spray-painted a little bit. Um, one of the things you'll see in this picture is a little piece of tape that's beneath the LEDs. They were using that tape to cover the LEDs um, once, uh, we, once we had everything up so and they running. just covered it up once, the, once it was actually yep. filming. Yep. They don't want any LEDs out in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> wouldn't be good for the realism of the show uh here's one of the cameras they were using yeah these were the ptz cameras um and these had really good uh night vision on them as well it's a nice little box here whatever this thing is all right so let's see here more cameras more cameras there's a mess mesh access point on the uh uh, pontoon boat so here's again here's out on the raft another picture out on the raft uh here's some guys <laughs> setting up stuff in the mangroves right above the water there i don't see the solar panel on this one i don't, don't even remember i asked brandon too like this battery box is hanging like literally right over the water like where <laughs> like did they strap that down to the to the tree How was that tied down to that tree? Uh, they were using fishing line for the most part, some heavy heavy duty fishing wire. I mean, do you think line. that would have held if it like tried to fall into the water? It was wedged in there pretty good in between the branches, so I don't think there was any uh, any major concern with it falling. Wow! Another picture. Did of I that. get any hazardous duty pay? No, I did not. Look at these guys. <laughs> Look at these guys. So, I mean, that's that's awesome. Look at them. They're they're like thirty feet up. Look at that. Yeah. Putting that solar panel in. 
And the only way to get up to these locations was literally just to climb up the, the rocks. Um, and, and the local guys would hesitantly put shoes on before doing that. And I was like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's see. Uh, Mark, how did the mesh APs fare with the salt air being beside open waters? Any issues with corrosion? Again, they, they weren't out there for more than two or three months, so it really wasn't enough time for that to become any sort of issue. If it would have been in direct salt spray, it'll kill it you know, within two to three days, but they weren't in direct spray range, so they were fine. More hanging... Solar panels and trees. Another location. Uh, okay, so here's some of the prep. This is them prepping the battery boxes ahead of time. So everything lined up, and then they just toss it out on a boat, take it out to whatever location. and. Yep, so we had a translator who was helping us with teaching the local guys how to set this up. Obviously, it was just, just me out there, so I couldn't be the hands-on to create a hundred of these boxes and pre-do them all so we had all of the equipment we we actually you did you did pre-measure and cut all the cables though didn't you i did not oh i thought you had done they, that nope i just sent them raw cable and they said they would create everything they would have the local guys do it wow so i mean i offered to do any you know i offered to pre-do all that and said no don't worry about it we'll do it here I said okay wow 146 people watching the stream. Thank you guys for joining. Again, we're talking to uh, Brandon here from Crosstalk about his experience setting up this crazy install we did for the TV show Castaways, premiering on ABC August 7th. Uh, there that. was another question. Someone asked, had some questions about PF Sense. I'm not a PF Sense expert, but if you want to put your question in there, I can see what I can do about getting it answered. Yeah. Another shot of uh, some stuff in the trees here. On the boat was that it at the end of the slideshow yeah that that seems like the end of that yeah we did one. have a little bit of uh drone footage let me uh let me pull that up <clears throat> so this was the initial design phase of where i was putting everything the explanation marks were there simply because everything was adopted but nothing was turned on yet and this is in uh this is in the uh, ubiquity map yep this is in unify all right, let's take a look at some of that beautiful drone footage. Uh, I'll put it into full screen here. Jonathan's asking what size batteries would we were used. We were using, I believe, 30 amp hour batteries. Um, and what I would use next time, I would probably just use two of them in, in, in parallel. There you go. There's, the, there's one of those crazy setups. So you've got one two three four solar panels to power this one so this was one of the more important locations right. so if this site goes down <clears throat> all of the communications went down um and there were also several radios at that location so the the, the draw was was pretty high so site cast is how big was the island seven how big was the island of the seven miles well uh, it was just it was just a part of the island so it was seven miles of coastline on the island it wasn't uh, it wasn't like the whole island yeah stevenson is asking if you have any experience <clears throat> with palo alto firewalls and what you think about integrating unify home installations with them what was it again uh he wants to know if you have any experience with palo alto firewalls and what do you think about integrating that onto a, a unify home network uh, I do not have any experience with Palo Alto firewalls, so unfortunately, I just don't have an opinion on that one way or the other. Um, James is asking about 12 volts powering the mesh access points. We were using special PoE injectors that had boost transformers that were able to increase the voltage to 24 volts. Which I think is similar to what I did in my solar-powered Wi-Fi Part 2, mm -hmm. uh, where I had a step-up converter that, that pushed everything from 12 volts to 24 volts. Is the nanostation loco M2 able to go through the trees? Um, yes and yes. I would have used 900 megahertz. The problem with 900 megahertz is you don't have range or enough throughput. So that was why we were using the 5 gigahertz. 
What is the local beer that you like, Chris? Well, I don't know the local beer out in the South Pacific, so. <laughs> yeah. God, look at that setup, man. That's so cool. So, yeah, here you can see Nano Station, Rocket M5 with Omni, Mesh Access Point, one, two, three, four solar panels. And there's a battery box in there somewhere, probably underneath these solar panels. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's up behind uh, the middle one. Oh, it's up here. Yeah, it's underneath that uh, that solar panel actually. What overall performance slash throughput uh, did you expect through the mesh? Um, I was expecting about a thirty to forty megabits per second. Um, like I said, the cameras only needed between three and four per camera, so that's kind of where our design came into play. We we what I ended up doing was taking several of these mesh access points out into a desert, stringing them out uh, about 600 feet apart, and set, going through several hops to get good line of sight tests, which is what I was assuming when I designed it that I would have good line of sight between the mesh radios, uh, and and we pretty much achieved that. Now, someone asked, how did this deployment compare to others you've done before complexity-wise? I mean, complexity-wise, it's not the design of the network. Um, the, co the complexity of this was the location and, um, and just, you know, stuff like this. You know, the, the fact that it was so remote and there was nothing out there that we had to kind of build all this stuff, um, you know, sort of from scratch. Or the, the locals had to build all this stuff from scratch. So that was really the difficulty, was just getting out there and, and get everything set up physically. The design of the network itself was relatively simple. Yeah, I mean, in in grand scale, this is probably one of the larger mesh networks I've ever designed. Definitely the largest one I've ever installed. Um, but the technology itself doesn't change whether it's a small or a large network. There's some a little bit of RF technology or uh, education that you need to have to make sure your your channels aren't overlapping. But other than that, that technology or or education can scale between small and large networks pretty pretty easily so it just depends on what you're looking to have done yeah uh, big super chat from lucas thank you very much lucas it says you guys keep making awesome videos truly amazing deployments you guys are doing what training would you recommend for someone trying to get into the wireless space in general um i would just recommend buying yourself some lab equipment and and getting hands-on training uh the training in in general is quite expensive and it's if you don't have any experience at all it might be beneficial to you but if you have just a little bit of IT knowledge and knowing how to Google and use YouTube you could probably figure it out yeah I, I would say the same thing I mean really it's just sourcing the equipment routers switches access points um, I mean honestly that's kind of what I do you know like one of my um, you know, when I start making these videos, a lot of times I just see a piece of equipment that I want to play around with, so I buy it, and I figure it out, I get it working, and then I make a video on it, and that's what I publish to YouTube. So, same thing, just, you know, we, you, no one starts off as an expert, right? You always have to uh, go through that learning curve, and the best way, in my opinion, to go through the learning curve is to just actually dig in and do it. Um, and if you're doing it in a lab environment, there's no consequences. You know, if you screw something up, just factory reset the equipment and and go back to uh, uh, go back to the square one. That's it. Uh, they're asking what drone that was being used. I believe it was a DJI Inspire One. Yeah, that's the nice big drone. Is that a six blade drone? The Inspire, uh, or is it still a four? I believe blade the drone? Inspire is a four blade. Four blade. Yeah, they have. Uh, another one that holds DSLR cameras, and that's the six-blade one. Yeah, that thing's awesome. It is. Uh, there you can see a there's a mesh or an omnidirectional antenna off the back of the boat right there. You can yeah. see. So that that's how we were communicating between the two boats, in addition to the VHF radio. But we had some data network between the two boats, so that each each of them had access to the camera network that was being deployed. Yes, DJI cameras are uh, drones are pretty nice. Uh, I've had a DJI Phantom 4 myself, uh, and now I have a unique Typhoon H. Got the uh, Phantom 4. I love that thing. Someone says, I already have a Network Plus from CompTIA. Uh, going to network, what certs would you get first? Um, none. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started on certs either. I, I mean, 
the more important thing than certifications is um, experience. Yeah. Um, Jay's asking any cell signals for contacts to home. No, we only had satellite phones. Yeah. Th while this was going on, um, I heard from Brandon twice in 12 days, I yeah. think. So, I mean, we did have satellite internet, so it was very slow at best. And then you had... 30 guys on a boat all trying to send an email or download stuff and upload pictures. <laughs> it was just, at one point, I said, all right, I need everyone off the internet, and I unplugged the router and plugged my computer directly into it. It actually worked after that. Yeah. Uh, I was just like, okay, you all got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> now, we had originally talked about maybe trying to do some sort of long-range backhaul from a neighboring island that did have internet. Uh, whatever happened to that? It just didn't pan out. Um, they they originally were talking about doing one, and it was a little over 30 miles away. We talked about doing an air fiber link over that range, which is more than possible. However, getting towers constructed in order to compensate for curvature of Earth and the Fresnel zone, it just wasn't feasible. And when you're shooting um, a signal that far over water, especially, right, isn't there a lot of the signal gets degraded just by virtue of the fact that you're going over water? Not necessarily. It's just not having the, the, the between the curvature of the Earth and the Fresnel zone hitting the water. Yes. So mm -hmm. as long as your Fresnel zone is above the water, it's it's not that big of a deal. And tides, I imagine, would be tides do affect your Fresnel zone. So you can lose up to fifty percent signal uh, throughput if your the bottom lobe of the Fresnel zone is is impeded. Wow. Ryan says, am I the only person who lives in the Pacific Northwest specifically because of the lack of sun? <laughs> Random thought, seeing all the sun in the pictures, then looking outside. Yeah, we. I'm in the Pacific Northwest too, but not necessarily because of that reason. Uh, but I do hear what you're saying. I'd actually like to maybe get to a place where there's a little bit more sun. What do you guys think about Elon Musk's attempts for better satellite internet? I think anyone who is attempting to provide better internet connectivity to the world, especially the more disenfranchised areas where they don't have the opportunity to have decent internet access. I think anyone trying to pull that off is is doing a good thing. Reno's a little too hot, Jay. That's a, <laughs> I've been to Reno. It's just a little too hot. Yeah. Which cameras were they using? How many cameras were deployed? I'm not sure what the cameras were. It was some off-brand but there were these uh, PTZ cameras that had decent, um, uh, they had decent night vision, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember the brand. It started with a Z. Yeah, Zoltac or something. Some, some it was definitely an off-brand. They had good uh, night vision on them, which was the main use reason for them. Had PTZ capabilities. <laughs> option, reason number two. Look at these birds. And uh, Zavio, that's what it was. Thank you, sir. Yep, Jay lost audio. It still looks like it's broadcasting on our end, Jay. Um, it was a Zavio camera. Um, but we had a uh, custom enclosure that we designed and made so that everything would work off of the batteries. Um, inside of it was a small switch, uh, 24 volt to operate the uh, 24 volt boost transformer to operate the mesh access point on it a 12 volt uh, sorry a 5 volt drop down converter to power the switch and then straight through power to power the camera so it was a, a lot of electronics going inside on the inside of it also there was a raspberry pi that we're using as a local controller to record the video too and then the oh, live, really? yeah so they were recording it locally in, in hd and then they just use really low bit rates to go over the wireless mesh oh that's interesting so, so yeah it was a, a custom firmware that they had for huh. it and so they'll probably then be able to use that footage that was that uh, was so the they option. had a raspberry pi at every camera every camera had a raspberry pi i wonder what storage card they were using it must have been like 128 gig you no, know it was probably just a, a 64 gig might have been a 128 gig. i don't really know uh, but they they used these they were changed the SD cards out daily and they dumped them and stored them on their, their local drives that they were on the boats. So uh, Mustafa's a little bit behind the curve here. <laughs> when are you deploying the network on that island and will you be giving details about it? So uh, go back when we're done with the stream, go back to the beginning of the stream, we cover all that stuff. This is a deployment that was already done. Uh, this was done 
uh, a few months, uh, six months ago. So this is uh, this has been a long time since we actually did this deployment. So Jeff says, hi, Chris, just want to take the opportunity to say thank you. Your videos have been a huge asset and I'm definitely a Ubiquity fan. Do you think they are raising prices now because of their popularity? No, uh, I think the boost in prices that we've seen are probably more related to um, supply chain issues and just the cost of actual components going up. So specifically, I've seen the price on the Ubiquiti cameras go up a little bit, and I've seen the price on like the UAPAC Pro uh, go up a little bit. And I think that's just because of like the PoE chip in those devices is a little little pricey or something. Yep. Uh, Mark says, what do you guys think about the Gen 2 cloud key that's coming from UBNT versus the existing one? Let's take a look at it. Might as well. So I know a little bit about the new cloud key. It's supposed to have a NVR built into it as well. Um, no, there's two. There's, so there's a cloud key plus, okay. which has the NVR built in it. Then there's a Gen 2 cloud key, which is um, which I'll show you here from the... Uh, let's see. I know that the traditional cloud key has changed the usb is now a usb type c if you have a usb type c connector instead of the micro connector um, that is the newer model however they last time i deployed these uh, still having a lot of issues where the database is getting corrupt because they're using poe on the switch and the switch isn't plugged into a ups so if you guys are deploying these cloud keys make sure however you're powering them has a backup power solution if you don't you're going to corrupt that database if you lose power to it and you're calling us to try and get those restored so they must have heard about those issues so here's the unify cloud key gen 2 you can see it's a little bit smaller than the one that has the the hard drive inside but both of them now have built-in battery for automatic safe shutdown okay so they sort of probably took their cues from the first cloud key and realized, hey, these things have are susceptible to power issues. We better fix that. And so now they have uh, batteries built in. So it says four times more powerful than the original cloud key. I assume that's just more CPU power or something. Uh, easy Bluetooth setup with the Unify mobile app. Now that's interesting. So the old cloud key, I don't think you could set up. You certainly couldn't do it with Bluetooth. Um, no. I, you couldn't set it up via the U-Mobile app at all, if I remember correctly. So this one's powered by USB-C or 802.3 AF. Built-in battery, and then it's got this uh, front panel display that shows your throughput and how many devices are online or offline. Got a question from Jacob here. He says he's having problems with the, UA, with the AP Pro to get gigabit speeds, I get about 150 megabits per second. Most likely, that is the speed of your network drive card on your laptop. Look at this. Cloud key rack link. What is that, you think? Oh, that's, that's something new. Um, I believe one of the things they were trying to do is make these rack mountable. So that might be something that has to do with that. Uh, Barger's on the, hey Barger, how's it going? So David Barger's in the chat. David is also one of our spectacular ubiquity and networking experts. Uh, David says they desperately need a graceful shutdown circuit. I can't wait to try it out. Yeah, so I think that's kind of what this thing is, the built-in battery. Let's take a look at the Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus. So this is the one that is, and look at the prices on these, by the way. 179 for the Gen 2 and 199 for the Gen 2 Plus. <laughs> so $20 more and you get a one terabyte hard drive inside there. Um, so this one says easy setup, same thing, powered by 802.3 AF PoE or QC 2.0 USB-C, built-in battery, same thing, and then one terabyte, two and a half inch drive included. Um, so this one is also supposedly able to be an NVR, uh, though again, I would have to, I would be curious about the number of cameras it would actually support, because um, there are two terabyte NVR, I don't ever put more than 10 cameras on and that that's, thing. And that's pushing it. Um, uh, there, there's a couple of issues when you start getting into those, those NVRs with single hard drives, especially at the lower RPM drives, you're not going to be able to write the data to them quick enough. 
Also, they just have an ARM processor, so they just don't have the CPU power to transcode the videos properly in, in store them. Yeah. And the, uh, I mean, one of the reasons that I like doing our NVR builds is because you can also have a local monitor plugged into the NVR for just a local display of the cameras, whereas the Ubiquiti NVR, even though it has an HDMI port, and I think it also has a DV, uh, VGA port as well, it does. if I'm not mistaken, um, no, neither, of the, neither of those are actually functional other than to display the you know CLI of the OS. <clears throat> Speaking of Unify, do you think that the Nano HD can handle really more clients in the 5 gigahertz band even if the clients are not multi-user MIMO capable? Um, I mean, it has more, you know, I think of multi-user MIMO as like a highway, right? And so even if you have clients that aren't multi-user MIMO capable, you can have more, like say that you've got a four lane highway, like a four by four MIMO, and you have a client that's only one by one, it's not, you know, multi-user MIMO capable, it's going to take up one lane of that highway. Well, even while that traffic is going by, there's still three other lanes of the highway available for other devices at any given time. So I think it's more capable in that sense. You could have four non-multi-user MIMO devices simultaneously communicating um, on that device. What's your opinion on the marketing for the G3 Flex? The Their outdoor use marketing seems overblown. UBNT pictures of them put them in your backyard or a pole exposed, QSG under Oh, Quick Start Guide says under an easement, an easement, or a, you know, an eave. Um, I have the flex, and that's what I. One of the things I said in my video, I didn't see in the Quick Start Guide that it said you needed to put it under an eave. But my own, just in looking at it, I was able to confirm that like there's no way this thing is going to be able to survive directly in the elements. Um, so yeah. I, I was, I'm not sure about their marketing as far as like if that was intentionally trying to deceive people into buying it or something. But I mean, listen, guys, it's a $79 camera. You know, what do you expect for 79 bucks? Uh, question from Brian says, I'm planning a Loco M5 bridge over 151 foot line of sight with no obstructions, but they're not going to be parallel to each other. Uh, about five degrees off of 90 five degrees off of 90 degrees should be fine don't know that i quite understand the question there brian if you can rephrase that or if you want to drop us an email i might be able to help you a little bit better so mark writes chris from your guest network with captive portal video from a year ago did the long authorization delay ever get resolved or still with those 20 second waits for clients getting ip access so for that particular customer what i ended up doing was um I just gave them a, a cloud key, I believe. So I just went local with the controller and I took it off of the cloud for the captive portal and it just I never went back and revisited the issue. Um, since then, I don't think... I'm trying to think if we've even done any captive portals since then. I don't like doing captive portals, um, especially for hotel environments. Um, in my opinion, the captive portals... I mean, just, I don't know. I prefer to just have a Wi-Fi password for the level of hotels that we do. Now, if you're going to be staying at like a Marriott or something, which is a lot bigger than the type of deployments that we typically do. I mean, granted, lo I, listen, I'd love to land Marriott as a, as a wireless client, <laughs> but I wouldn't be using Ubiquity for a hotel of that size, nor would I be using the U Unify Captive Portal. That's really for much smaller scale deployments. And they have like, enterprise level captive portals that like integrate with the room billing systems and stuff you know you've seen where you go to a hotel and it says enter your room number enter your last name in order to connect to the wi-fi those types of captive portals are the more mainstream enterprise level captive portals that you should be using in a hotel deployment that needs captive portal capability um, for like something like a motel six or a smaller hotel motel um you can do the Ubiquity Captive Portal, but I strongly recommend to those clients just have a password on the Wi-Fi. It's yeah. so much easier. And the one thing that I've learned about hotel owners is that 
they just don't want to ever hear about problems with Wi-Fi. They just want it to work. Yep. If they don't hear, if they don't get complaints from their customers, then they're happy. A um, couple more questions here. Someone's asking about. Let me go back up a little here. Um, where we purchase our our ubiquity gear. Uh, we shop around. Uh, sometimes we get it on Amazon. Sometimes we get it directly from the dist- from from Ubiquity. It just depends on what we're buying, who has it in stock, and the prices. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Brian T, five dollars super chat. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for all your videos, especially the Unify ones. I've learned a lot from them, and I look forward to many more in the future. Well, Brian, thank you so much for the super chat, and uh, yeah, cheers, man. We got more videos coming, uh, not only on Ubiquity stuff, but on other stuff as well. You guys can probably see some other equipment that I have in the background here, so we'll be doing some additional stuff pretty soon. What did you guys think of the uh, POC Ethernet? Did you guys see that video? That thing was awesome. I was just showing it to Brandon earlier today. Um, I- I'm really impressed with that device, and and like I said, the, the guy that created it has been very um, proactive about helping out and answering questions, and, and uh, just been, been really great on the whole thing. So I'm very impressed with that. So we have another question here. It says, what would you suggest for a, f- for a short 50 yard run point to point? Trenching is not an option. I was looking at two nano station ACs trying to get internet to a shed. Um, really, again, there's a couple of variables that need to be answered there is, do you have line of sight? Are you going through any trees? What kind of speeds are you trying to get? And your budget. Um, right off the bat, I would probably tell you that the ACs are, are a great a pair of bridges especially at that short range if you're going through any sort of vegetation that goes out the window and you either have to use 2.4 gigahertz or 900 megahertz yeah all right lots of lots of love for the pock ethernet yeah that thing is awesome oh just arrived today and you're loving it awesome how yeah. long how long did it take you to get it after you ordered it yeah phil how long did it take to get in because mine took about 48 hours to come from germany which totally astounded me i was like unbelievably i thought that they expedited the shipping for me but they didn't um, someone else said, um, I saw, I saw something I wanted to answer. Hang on a second. Let's see. Jonathan's asking what DNS servers we're using. Um, typically you, I use 1.1.1.1 and 8.8.8.8. This is the, my two go-to, uh, sometimes I use an <clears throat> open DNS if I need any sort of, uh, restrictions to, to be in place. Yeah, I, I'm exactly the same. I usually do 1.1.1.1 primary and 8.8.8.8 secondary. Um, Two days so, shipping to the UK. That's that's impressive. That's they're, great. They're coming out of Germany. So Phil, glad it's uh, you're you're seeing the same results we are here in the US. So uh, McDuff 001 says, when is the next installment of the UBRSS tutorials? That should be coming. I actually have the next two videos. I just have to edit them and release them. My goal is to get the next video out on Tuesday. And then uh, the, the next video after that out, uh, you know, in the following week. I'm going to try to do one a week. We were actually going to do, um, so the next video is on firewalls and setting up firewall rules in EdgeMax. Um, we were supposed to get that video out Thursday, but there were a couple of issues with the video that was recorded. So uh, Kevin was nice enough to re-record the video and I have the re-recorded version. I just haven't edited it yet. So it's coming uh, hopefully next week. Jonathan's asking, what about local DNS? Typically, I just use the gateway and let the gateway do its own caching. Yeah. Will there be a giveaway for 75,000 subscribers? Well, let's see. How close are we? 74,858. I am not currently planning a giveaway for 74,000. I will probably do a... In lieu of a giveaway for 75,000, I will probably do a large giveaway for 100,000. Yep. That would be cool. Um, and that'll be probably May, March to May next year, if everything keeps going as it's going. So, yeah, just keep subscribed, guys. Keep an eye on the channel. And uh, I'm going to try to line up some uh, some sponsors to give away some really good prizes for $100,000. Um, so that'll be, uh, that'll be awesome. I'm looking at this page here. There's some new stuff that I actually haven't seen. What's this Light AP GPS? So that is similar to the the... The, the light beam? The light beam AC? The, the light beam AC access point, but this one has GPS synchronization, so you can It's play, a lot smaller. You can co-locate them, yeah. 90 degree sector antenna and GPS sync. So you haven't really gotten into the multi 
access points and and needle utilizing GPS sync. When I you utilize not. GPS sync, you're 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 synchronizing your transmit and receive across all of those, so you're not having as much uh, co-location chatter between the radios. It's a lot smaller than the other light beam. It does look like it's a lot smaller. It's also a 90 degree versus a 120. So you're going to be able to put oh, four of gotcha. those in, in, in the same amount of 360 degrees. Uh, all right. So let's see what else we this see is, here. Uh, someone's asking if we will ever do a UAS XG setup video. I don't foresee that one just because of the price point. Um, unless you want to donate it to us, then I don't know that we're ever going to get to that one. Yeah, I, and the, the, we don't we don't use that equipment a lot. I think we've only ever deployed one or two XGs, and uh, they were the edge edge version of the XG. Um, so again, I mean, I'm happy to do a video. I, I do have contacts at Ubiquity that occasionally send me things, and if they were to send me one, I would absolutely do a video on it. Um, but I don't think they're marketing. I mean, if I was Ubiquity and I'm looking at a guy who's doing, you know, videos about their products, I would probably send personally, I would send me the products that they would expect most people to buy. And the XG is not one of those products. The XG is a much more specialty sort of niche product. Not everyone's going to want or need an XG. In fact, it's a relatively small market compared to something like the Nano HD access point. Right, which everyone's gonna want one of those. So, yeah. uh, so that's that's anyways. That's the way I look at it. And at the, at the price point for those Nano HDs, I look for them to stop doing uh, the H the AC Pros and and move to those Nano HDs because they're really close in price point and they're actually smaller than the Pro Access point. Yeah, look at this new Bullet AC as well. Not a fan of the Bullet products. Well, maybe this one will be better. So this is AC. It's two dual band. Covering a wide range, wide range of frequency. So why don't you like the bullets? Are they just not enough range? Not enough range. They don't produce their. They don't have an antenna for it. So there's no ubiquity branded antenna for these things. So you got to find an antenna that's now going to have dual band antennas in it. Um, which there are definitely lots of antennas. It out doesn't there. work just standalone. Nope. You got to have an antenna. That's just like a rocket. Oh. Um, and they are not dual polarized. So every. All of this equipment that I focus on is 90% dual polarized equipment. The rocket, uh, sorry, the bullets are single polarization. So you're only getting either a horizontal or a vertical polarization, depending on the antenna that you pick. And then, okay, I see what you're saying. And for $116. Yeah, I would rather, there, there's, there's some better products. Uh, something like that might be good on a boat if you're trying to get uh, some long range uh wi-fi coverage off of off of shore yeah um but i still think that there are better products out there that are, are better fitted for that situation just just my personal sense so if you guys have a, a different use case then we're happy to hear it what do you think about the skins are they a gag no i don't think so <clears throat> i think the i think the skins for like the nano hd they also have skins have you seen they have skins for the um flex camera I have not. Yeah, look. Here, I'll show you. Oh. oh. I thought they had them in here. Wait a minute. I know. I mean... D3 Flex Skins. Let's see if there's some pictures of it. Uh, I saw pictures of it somewhere. Where, I thought it was on their website. Am I... Uh, oh, maybe... Oh, you know what? It's not in the store. That's what it is. It's on the main site. Uh, products, surveillance, or unify video. Here we go. There we go. Look, black camo, marble, wood, and let's look at that lighter another, marble. A different marble. I don't know. No, this is like concrete or something. So I don't think so for the for the flex. Uh, you know, again, I don't know what the what the market they're trying to hit with this stuff. Um, however, for the like the Nano HD access points, I don't think those are gimmicky. I think some of the skins are gimmicky. Like, I can't imagine who would need a camouflage one if you're unless you're going to have it outside in a Put tree in a or tree, something. Yeah. But hey, it would have been great out there in in the South Pacific. <clears throat> there's like a um, there's a client of mine who's actually a local client in this area who is a 
uh, like a brew pub type place. And their entire inside of their restaurant is all sort of like wood paneling and just like nice sort of like really good like woodwork and stuff. And I have very old UAPs. I have the 2.4 gigahertz UAPs are what I have in there because I did it like two or three years ago. I have some, I have the 2.4 LR and that thing is... You get into a lot of near far situations with those. Yeah. So, so for that client, it's something that like when their UAPs die or when Unify um, gets to a version that outdates their UAPs, I will suggest to them like the nanos, and I would suggest like the wood skins because it would blend into the actual wall of their restaurant and not be like this white on wood with a you know in this case a green LED ring on the UAP. So here's a question for you. What what do you typically recommend a refresh cycle would be on these access points? Two people? years. Two, I would say three to five. I would say two to three, Yeah. Uh, personally. So we, we ran into a situation recently where, um, you, you remember I did a video not that long ago called like Unify Site Migration, where I took mm-hmm. sites and I moved sites from one controller to another. So in that process, we were going from a version like 5.6. something controller to um, a 5.8 version controller and so for like two of the sites that i moved they had the uap outdoor not the outdoor plus but the older outdoor yeah and it only the single 2.4 gigahertz Uh and those are no longer compatible they're end of life as far as ubiquity is concerned so when i moved the site over to um the newer software it basically all of those access points i don't think it knocked them offline i think they still worked you just can't ever update them anymore. You right. can't They're... upgrade them. You can't provision them. You can't do anything with them anymore. And so I had two different sites where we had to recommend to the client, like, look, you're gonna have to, you're yeah. gonna have to, um, you know, upgrade these. And that was within both were a two to three year time frame yeah. that so, I installed the stuff. So that's just something else to, to take into consideration when you guys are building out your networks or designing your networks. You guys need to make sure that you're uh, budgeting every, you know two, three years for a cycle, you know, a refresh cycle on those. And maybe not a hundred percent refresh cycle, but just start phasing out some of the older equipment. Yeah. All right. Well, any other questions? We are probably got about a half hour left that we're going to sit here and answer questions and talk to you guys. So if you have any more questions, now is the time. Certainly if you have any super chats, go ahead and pop those super chats in now. We will definitely get those questions answered for you. Um, it says the nano HD can also get concealed in the ceiling. They did. They have a picture of that right here. Uh, somewhere, one of these is a shot of it concealed in the ceiling. So there it is. Yep. So that's kind of kind of turns it into a small dome style camera. Yeah. And I, uh, I'm a little mixed on. But I the... think the Nano HD he's talking about is the access point. Oh, not the, the flush. flush. Yeah, the Nano HD has a flush. Um, I think let's see if I can find a picture of that. The Nano HD has a flush mount as well. Where is that thing? Nano HD. Here it is. Uh, do they have a picture of the flush mount? Yeah, there it is. So low profile mounting. Coming soon. So it's an accessory sold separately that's coming soon. I think it's interesting that they're doing a lot of like access point accessories. Just add-ons. Any anytime you can add on and something else, you're just increase increasing your profit margin. Yeah. So and 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 different options. I mean, a lot of people might like that option. It's not something I would personally use. Steve, Steve, 99 cent super chat. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Um, Mark is asking, uh, loved your fling wax review with the block device feature using ARP provisioning. Any way to protect against it on UBNT network or would you need something like a PFSense router? So that's a really good question. Um, You know, one of the things that I asked in that video, I asked of the audience was, hey, how would you prevent a device like the Thingbox from getting on and doing ARP spoofing on the network? And I didn't really get what I would consider to be like a definitive answer to that question. Um, There's something, so so here, here, and here's the, here's the difficult part about it is what size organization are we talking about? Because if you're talking about the SMB space, no chance that people are going to have protections in place to prevent ARP spoofing on their network. No chance. 
I mean, I'm talking 99% of SMBs do not have a way to prevent that from happening. In the enterprise space, you have port security. You can do potentially MAC address filtering, things like that. But even in the enterprise space where you have a real team of IT pros that are handling that stuff, have they thought of the contingency of someone bringing in something like a Fingbox or a Disney Circle and just running ARP spoofing on the network? Oftentimes, they're not going to have th thought of that ahead of time. They will think of it when someone actually does it, and then they're like, oh crap, how do we prevent that from happening in the future? So no one was able to give me a real good answer of like, yes, this is how you would prevent that bulletproof every time, no problem, and this should be standard part of every network. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things that are reactive instead of proactive in the IT industry, and we yeah. don't. You know, we can't anticipate or plan for every thing that's going to happen, but having the skills to do the research and learn how to fix and prevent it from happening again is where we come in. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's something that a lot of people have um, complained about with the ubiquity switches is there's no port security. Um, so that's, you know, like that was one of the comments that a few people made on the um, sort of the value of ubiquity video that I did where I talked about their marketing material and they had they were like comparing themselves to Cisco and Cisco Meraki and Aruba and Ruckus. And um, and I just don't th I just think there's some features that Unify lacks bef that they should implement before they compare themselves in that enterprise space. Um a lot of enterprise networks that are going to be installing or they're of the size to install something like a Cisco or a Aruba um, deployment, um, the, they're not going to have vanilla network needs. They're going to have more complex network needs. They're going to have multiple subnets. They're going to have firewall rules between those subnets and things like that. And there are their needs outweigh what Unify can do for them. Absolutely. And so it's just, you know, when we're doing a really vanilla network, we're fine with Unify. But when we're doing larger scale networks, like we just did a, um, actually, David, I don't know if David's still on the stream here, but we did a, a uh, cryptocurrency data center, mining data center with like 400 plus, 500 plus ASIC miners. And we didn't use Unify for that. Man, we use edge devices because, you know, it just, they just work better. Um, we can monitor everything with UNMS, and uh, and I just am more comfortable in a large, large deployment like that, having the extra feature set that edge devices provide versus Unify. Right. I mean, Unify has come a long way, especially in the past 24 months, but you're still going to get a lot more granular control with edge than you are over Unify. Yeah. And if I was doing a large wireless deployment, for something like a Marriott hotel or something like that, uh, I would probably be going ruckus. Um, only because I've installed Unify into hotels, so I understand how that experience works and I understand how well it works. And when you're, you know, if you're in Las Vegas, like we stayed at the, we were in Vegas a couple weeks ago and we stayed at the Cosmopolitan. Okay. It's this massive, massive, like 3,000 plus room hotel. You're not going to put Unify access points into a hotel like that. You're just not. You're going to have a very tough time if you do. So something like, uh, they were specifically using Aruba, uh, but I've also been to multiple other larger hotels, and it's it's typically either Ruckus or Aruba. Or Meraki. Or Meraki, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, like, if, if I got a job where it was like, hey, you need to deploy you know, there's a 500 plus room hotel you need to deploy wireless in. I'm not looking at Unify for that. I'm looking at, at, at probably Ruckus. So I've got a question here that's asking about RF element horns. If Do you need to plug in? Your laptop's blinking at you. Yeah, it's all right. If it dies, I'll look at yours. Okay. <laughs> um, if we've ever used RF element horns on an installation. Um, yes, I've used them in a number of WISPs and have recommended them to a number of different clients that I have installed. They are a fantastic horn antenna. Um, is there any specific question you had about those? I would like to monitor. Okay, so here's Paul North. Uh, hello, Chris and fellow presenter. Brandon. 
<laughs> uh, can you recommend a monitoring tool other than the built-in Unify monitoring for the AC Pro? I only have AC Pros in the network. I would like to monitor traffic and usage down to the websites being visited. Well, first things first, Paul, that's going to be difficult with HTTPS, right? Most websites these days are HTTPS, which just means that you're not going to get the URLs um, at all. I mean, sometimes they have some sites that are a mixture where it's like HTTPS and then some of like the images are pulling from HTTP and then you can actually see sort of like where yeah. it, it came from. But by and large, if you look at like Unify's DPI, you're just going to get a block for HTTPS traffic. You're not going to be able to granularly, granularly see the actual websites that were visited. Now, if you do need to see the actual websites that are visited, then you got to use something like a proxy server where you can actually log that stuff from your own network as opposed to um, you know relying on something like Unify, which just doesn't have visibility into that. Hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Have you ever used proxy server like Squid or? I've used a Squid, squid server. Um, I'm not going to discuss why I was using that on this though. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, Paul, a UTM device such as Palo Alto or Fortigate would help as well. Yes, so that's the other thing. Uh, and by the way, another thing that um, Ubiquity is lacking is solid UTM. So UTM is Universal Threat Management. What does that stand for? I don't want to You guys, well, the guy in the comments will tell us. What does UTM stand for, guys? I think it's, I'm going to say Universal Threat Management. Maybe I'm wrong about that acronym. But yeah, there are other firewalls, Barracudas, Fortinets, um, Palo Altos, etc. Oh, David Barger said that's it. Oh, unified threat. Unified threat management? Or you. Anyways, uh, something threat management. Um, and, uh, and so those devices are, um, you know, made for, for more enterprise stuff like that. Again, and I get this all the time, like Ubiquity is trying to compare themselves to enterprise level um, competitors when I don't think Ubiquity is enterprise level. Um, definitely not. I would classify them more in SMB than, than, than enterprise. Definitely SMB and maybe like medium enterprise if the installation is really vanilla. Power user for homes? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Brian T, another $5 super chat. Thank you so much. Have you ever tried installing OpenVPN software on a USG? Or would you consider making a video on it? I'm not sure that's even possible with the Unify line. So that's another thing where we get into if you need to start doing some more complicated VPN deployments with Unify, don't use Unify yeah. <laughs> because it just does not work well. So this has always been a problem um, where like Unify had the ability to do either site to site or client server VPN, but not both simultaneously. I think that's still a problem. Uh, and if you do need to do both simultaneously, you had to go in and modify JSON files in the back end of Unify controller, and then pray to God that when you apply that JSON, it doesn't put your USG into a boot loop. Yeah. So when it comes to that kind of stuff, as consultants and as network consultants who specify, uh, who specify, Specialize, specialize okay. in Unify, we tell people on a fairly regular basis, we won't do that for you. Yeah. If you if you call us and ask us to do something that requires us to ask to edit a JSON file, we will tell you no. We will say no. We will absolutely 100% refuse to do that. Um, we will recommend that you switch to something else like the Edge devices or some other device that will have the capability you need built in. Um, but you know, especially when we're talking about someone who's like a home user with a USG and they want to do some fancy stuff, it's like, well, you got a hundred dollar router, man, just replace it with one that'll do what you want it to do. You might spend yeah. a little bit more, but you're going to spend way more in time and frustration than you will just buying a device that can do what you need it to do. The right tool for the right job, right? It applies in everything, including networking. So the, the edge line even their basic edge router x it's a 50 dollars router can do both site to site and users at the same time it's a great little router especially for home use under 100 megabit uh, transfer rates yeah 
and I've seen it on sale multiple times. If you guys don't, if you guys follow me on Twitter, if I ever see a really good sale, I will tweet it out. Um, I tweeted out they had a sale on the Edge Router X a while ago. It was either thirty four ninety nine or thirty nine ninety nine. Uh, it was on sale, and normally it's only fifty bucks anyways. But it was like fifteen or twenty percent off of fifty bucks, and it was like that's an amazing deal, right? And it's also, by the way, the, the Edge Router X is also a really good learning tool. If you're looking to learn UNMS, if you're looking to learn Edge Max and just basic routing and VPNs and firewalls, Edge Router X is a wonderful learning tool for 50 bucks. Yeah, and especially for homes, you're not putting the additional uh, CPU utilization on it because it has a true switch chipset in it, unlike the other uh, higher-end Edge Routers. Which is, cr it's still crazy to me that they don't have like, like my Edge Router 8 that I've got sitting back here on the shelf doesn't have the switching capability of the Edge Router X. Uh, Double Radius always has good open box sales if you're willing to take the risk. And pay for you shipping. You want to talk about Double Radius? Uh, uh, and pay for shipping. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so David Barger, uh, our good friend David, another issue, OpenVPN is not hardware offload compatible with Unify. Like they said, Edge Max is more capable when it comes to VPN flexibility. So that is a that's a really good point. If you're looking to do some hardware offloading onto the um, other chips in the devices, um, Unify just won't do it. Again, Unify for me is is just vanilla. That's what I think of when I think Unify. If you have a very straightforward network, you just need connectivity. You need simple firewall rules, and you know maybe DPI, which honestly. DPI to me, I mean, it's it works. Don't get me wrong, but how often are people in the SMB space going through and searching through their DPI information? And by the way, what does it really tell you, anyways? It doesn't tell you a ton of anything. It, it'll tell you who's what. It'll tell you if someone was watching Netflix. Won't necessarily tell you who. Yeah, exactly. I was trying to, uh, you know, and that's another 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 failing of um, Unify. So. I had a situation here in my home, and I run a USG. Um, I've had it running for a long time. I'm actually probably going to switch it out for the Edge Router 4, um, or the 6P, actually, since I have that one. I might as well use that one. Uh, but I had a situation a while ago where, maybe it was like two or three weeks ago, where I was on my laptop upstairs in bed, just hanging out, watching TV, working on my laptop, and my internet connection was really bad. It was really spotty for some reason. And I was pinging out to the internet. I was getting maybe like 10 to 15% of the pings through. So I was getting like maybe 80 to 90% packet loss out to the internet. And um, the speeds were just terrible and Netflix was chunking. And I just, I went into Unify to, and all I wanted to see was what device is sucking up all my bandwidth right now and that's a setting that i was not able to find in unify uh -uh. like i didn't like that's that's something that you would think would be like hey show me what's happening on the network this instant and so because unify doesn't update fast enough and because unify relies on you know i have a cloud host at unify not local so it relies on the devices to upload their information to the cloud and my internet wasn't working at the time it just was not a statistic that I was able to get at all. Want to know what the answer was? Um, probably one of the kids. No. No. Uh, I was running Adobe Creative Cloud updates. Oh. And Adobe Creative Cloud updates hosed my network. Like, I don't know why. It just, for some reason, it just it just sucked up. Like, it didn't follow my QoS rules or something. I don't know what it was. I had mm -hmm. smart queuing enabled. And still, it killed my network. As soon as I canceled my uh, Photoshop and Premiere Pro updates on my laptop, uh, the network came right back. One, one person says, he's just, I bet it's iPhone backing up at nighttime. And I have seen that a lot, too. If you have a phone that hasn't been online for a long time, all of a sudden, you put it back on the Internet. It's trying to upload all of your pictures to the cloud. It'll kill your Internet. Yeah. Um, just saw a question about... Uh, someone who just purchased a whole Unify stack and then wanted to... Oh, just buy... It's Peter Peter Skite. Yeah. 
don't know that I would put a PFSense router in place. Uh, I mean, it's it's one or the other. You're just going to be creating a double NAT unless you're doing some some strict NATting rules at, at your core level. So don't know that that would necessarily be, ne necessarily be the proper solution if you're just wanting to play with PFSense. Put it after, after it and create a second network off of that um, is, is the only thing I could recommend there. Yeah. So Steve says, who is your ISP and what is the data rate? So I have um, Spectrum Business, and they are, my connection here is a 300 by 20. There you go. I wish I could get better, honestly. It's the upload that kills me, because I do uploads to YouTube, so. But wouldn't you like to be at the core of my of my WISP with a 10 gig uplink? I would absolutely love to have a 10 gig uplink. It would be amazing. Uh, by the way, while I was on... Um, uh, one of my other guys here is, is hitting me up on Discord, uh, and he said that um, my supplier called and the G3 cameras are in. So anyone who's looking to get G3 cameras, especially the five packs, it looks like they're starting to now arrive um, at various suppliers out there. Very cool. Well, just a few more minutes, guys, and I think we're going to wrap this up. Um, anyone else? Well, by the way, Travis, so Travis, I don't know, he must be familiar with the area. So he's talking about Coastcom. Coastcom is a um, local uh, fiber outfit. They were recently purchased by Wave Broadband. Um, Wave Broadband is another ISP that's in my area. Um, Coastcom was primarily a fiber provider. So they were the people that were running fiber up and down the Oregon coast. Um, I don't know how much into ISP stuff they got. And then, of course, they were bought out by Wave Broadband. So now they are no more. Look at this. So Peter says, oh, uh, Fezes. Fiz, Again, I can't pronounce his name. I don't know how Not to say that. Not even a try. Sorry. I don't know how to say that, man. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Wellman says, uh, you could run PFSense in transparent bridge mode in front of your USG. But see, like, at that point, like, why not just run PFSense? Like, why would you then even want to double it with your with the USG? And someone probably said, "Oh, no need for double NAT." Well, yeah, transparent bridge mode, sure. But if you're if you need what PFSense is offering or can provide, just use PFSense. Yeah, the, the... <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, uh, okay, so Mark Hanley, five euro super chat. Thank you so much for that. Would you get a basic lab? What would you get for a basic lab to learn Unify? A USG plus Switch 8 plus AP Lite or Edge Router X, something else. So if you want to learn Unify, you don't want an Edge device, right? So if you want to learn Unify and you want a basic kit to learn Unify, I'll give you the least expensive kit that you can get. Uh, USG, uh, UAP AC Lite. Switch 8 60 watt. And a Switch 8 60 watt. Now, um, but the 60 watt can't power that UAP, just so you're aware. Oh, you'd have wait. to use yeah. You, no, yes. the new ones are are compatible. If you the get a, lights are eight hundred two or three. The new ones are. So what we're talking about is the access points are either powered by twenty four volt passive or eight hundred two dot three AF. The switch eight sixty watt can only do eight hundred two dot three AF. So if you want to utilize the PoE on the switch eight, you have to make sure that the access point you buy is compatible. And I'm not sure if the light is 802.3 AF or not. We're the, kind the, of debating on that. Yeah, the latest ones, I believe, are. Well, let's see if it's I out here. I know that they were they were in transition of, of moving all of those devices over to AF compatibility. Uh, let's see. Yeah, look at that, 802.3 AF and 24 volt so all of them now are af or at or 24 volt so good for them by the way for moving away from that proprietary yeah. 24 volt passive i think they got a lot of crap for that over the years i think that that was the a great move in order to acquire more market share for them in the unify line i really wish they would do the same thing on the ed on the air max devices but i don't foresee that happening in the near future <clears throat> i will say this too um mark if you are looking to learn Unify, all right, that's a really good setup, the one that I mentioned, right? So USG, UAP AC Lite, um, and then the US 860 watt. And then for the Unify controller, either get the cloud key or just install it on a local PC or something. Okay. Um, however, that's not 
the setup that I would recommend if you asked me, Chris, what's the best setup to learn networking? Okay, so if you want to learn networking, then I would go with the Edge Router X, you know, and then some Edge Switch, and you know, then you could still use a Unify Access Point. Um, but I would go with the Edge devices. If you're if you're more interested in, learn, in learning networking, go with Edge devices. If you're more interested in just learning the Unify stack, then get all Unify. Yeah. Okay, so uh, someone said about the cam HD Nano HD camo skin. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. I'm not going to answer that one again. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip around here. Uh, Tony Cassidy, do you think there's a way to get Edge firmware on a USG? No, there is not. Um, best way, best way is your video with AP, 8-port switch, USG, cloud key. Yeah, that is a good, I mean, so I do have a video. Thank you for the plug. Uh, who did that? Daniel Dill. <laughs> Thank you for the plug, Daniel. Um, I have a video on my channel. I think it's like my most popular video, actually. So if you just click on my videos and sort by most viewed, it's the top one. And it's called the complete unify setup start to finish and that video is a uh, usg a cloud key uh eight port 150 watt U uh, unify switch and the i think i did the uapac pro in that video for the access point yeah all right rust uh rust dottery dottery dot do doherty rust doherty doherty oh, i'm so bad at pronouncing Daughtry, things. Daughtry, i think Daughtry. Like uh, like Roger Daughtry from the Who. I'm guessing is that his name, Roger Daughtry. I think so. From the Who, anyways. Uh, approximately 200 feet line of sight bridge using two nano station AC loco fives would be at different heights. AGL above ground level. Above ground level. Okay, thank you. Will that be an issue? Thanks so much for the channel. I don't think the different heights are an issue as long as they're, you know, tuned correctly and pointed right. at each other correctly. So if get a j arm mount which is uh, basically looks like a satellite arm and then you can tilt those antennas so that they're kind of uh compensating for the different heights is what i would recommend there uh yeah the part number is u ub dash am that's a ubiquity arm um it's this one here i just did a web search for it. i don't know if this is the best price or whatever but this is what he's talking about this thing here let's yeah, see if we can go back it, that'll allow you to tilt it a little bit um, you can get the window mount. Don't recommend it. This is probably the cheapest and easiest route to go. They're typically between uh, 12 and $15 for these. Yeah, they just, sell them in 10 packs too. Yeah, you can get them in 10 packs for 60 bucks, and then it gets the cost down really low. Yeah. Okay, great question. Uh, oops, that's not the right window. And your, your laptop's dead now? Yeah, yeah. whatever. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh, Darty, Darty, Darty. Russ Doherty. All right, well, Russ, and hopefully that answers your question. Uh, let's see. I have line of sight bridge running with nanostation loco and nanostation point to point 300 MTS meters. Meters having lots of issues trying to run run VoIP with it. Well, I mean, there's your problem right there. So, what's your latency on the connection, right? So, are you having packet loss? Uh, is the latency consistent? What you know? How many milliseconds is it? Voice over IP in general, does not do well over wireless connections because of the state of the wireless connection. You know, voice over IP is a real-time protocol. Like if you're, if you're talking to someone and you're having a conversation, you know, you can't have syllables and letters cut out of the words that you're saying. And that's what packet loss does to you. If you're surfing the web, HTTP can compensate because if it misses a packet, it just sends another request, hey, resend this packet, right? And it happens very quickly and seamlessly to the user, even on a crappy latent connection. But voice over IP, you can't say, oh, resend that word that, you know, and then put it back into the sentence. Right. You just can't. An another thing you guys got to take into consideration is that these devices are not full duplex connections. So it can only send and then it can only receive. It does not do both at the same time unless you get into the air fiber line um, where it, 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 you have a dedicated radio for send and a dedicated radio for receive. So that is the other thing that you're, that you're having there. Um, I would have to look at your signal. You could be in a very noisy environment on, on your 5 gigahertz or whatever your nano stations are, lo are, are utilizing. If you want us to consult, we're happy to do that for you. We can take a look at it and see if we can get it optimized working better. But I would not recommend VOIP over a wireless link. Yeah. 
and we've we've had um, you know customers that that come to us on the phone system side of the house and they ask and they we ask them what kind of internet they have et cetera and they have wireless or satellite internet and we just we just flat out tell them we're not going to do that because it's we just know I mean I don't ever want to sell something to a client where I I'm not one hundred percent confident that it's going to work properly yeah. So your, your satisfaction is what we, we want. So if it's not something that we are going to be satisfied with, you're definitely not going to be satisfied with it. Exactly. Uh, okay, so let's see what else we got here. Uh, Mark, again, one question I always had. Do you need a Unify controller actively running for fast roaming zero handoff between Unify APs, or do they handle that themselves? Is my understanding that you would need to have the Unify controller running for that functionality? Right. And by the way... Zero handoff ne never works very well in Unify, anyways. So I wouldn't. I just wouldn't use that feature. So one of the things of zero <laughs> handoff is the the access points have to be in the same channel in order to work properly. If you're operating multiple radios on the same channel, you're going to have other collisions with with it. So it's not a feature we would typically enable. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it does ha seem to handle fairly graceful transitions between radios uh without it um the placement and output power of the access points is more important than just putting them anywhere willy-nilly and trying to rely on zero handoff roaming yeah and, and again if you're relying on your wireless for voip this is probably not the best product for it <clears throat> Why is there no edge access point from Ubiquity? That's a question for Ubiquity. I have no idea. Tony Cassidy. Wonder if Chris remembers the guy on Twitter with the satellite dish antenna and a rocket prism AC Gen 2. Yes, that's me. All right. Well, that was a, that looked like a fun project. So this guy took a like a direct TV dish and uh, hooked a rocket to it and successfully set up a point-to-point -point network. Yeah. So that. if you're using a reflector dish, uh, it, it'll greatly increase your... Uh, it's going to reduce their beam width. It's going to basically turn a 60-degree beam into like a 12-degree beam with the re with the right reflector dish. Have you built a Pi Unify controller? So, yeah, I have a video on that. It's called Raspberry Pi Unify. You can look at that in my history. Uh, all right, so let's call this last question. Last question comes from Ta'a. I have a really long link. First point-to-point -point light beam AC, 100 meters. Second hop, point-to-point -point Air Fiber 5X, 30 kilometers. But it's just a nanostation hop that lets me down. All I would say is avoid nanostation for any low latency use. I guess that's not a question. Right. But so, if, you're, if, you have 100, if you have a 100 meter nanostation link, first point-to-point -point light beam AC. So I guess that's point-to-point -point light beam AC to nanostation. So it's probably a point-to-point a point -point link and then... A second point-to-point -point link, um, in which case you need to make sure you've got some distance between your two radios, at least five to ten feet, um, and make sure you're not polluting your spectrum, you know, and causing yourself your own interference, which is most likely what's happening is you're not you're not properly managing your channels. Yeah, there's a lot to this wireless ISP stuff. I mean, that's why like you guys see me, you know, screwing around in the backyard with the stuff and and barely getting it able to work. Um, when we actually have to do deployments, that's when I rely on Brandon because Brandon has experience with this stuff. He understands, you know, what to look for, how to sp position the antennas, how to align them, how to properly protect them against interference and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and, you know, that's the expertise that he brings to the table. So, um, yeah, wireless ISP stuff. We hope to do more and more wireless ISP stuff in the future, not only videos, but certainly deployments as well as wireless ISP consulting. So if you guys have any questions or want to utilize us for any projects, we are absolutely available uh, for that kind of stuff. Um, let me go back and make sure that I put that on full screen. I did, all right, wonderful. Okay, so I think we're gonna call it here, guys. Um, thank you so much for joining, everyone that joined. What did we end up with as far as viewers? 175 people watching, that's amazing. Well, thank you guys so much for um, watching the live stream. I hope you guys enjoyed it, especially the part about Castaways, and make sure you watch Castaways on ABC, premiering August 7th. It was a project that we set up the Wi-Fi for. Uh, we can't take any more credit for the <laughs> for the show than that. No, sir. Uh, but we were happy to go out there, and it was a really fun project, so uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this sort of behind-the-scenes look at it as well. And, uh, yeah, 
That's about it, guys. Thank you so much. And we are going to sign off here. If you guys like this, please give us a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the channel to see more wonderful wireless ISP and networking content. All right, guys. Thanks again. And we will see you in the next one.